Um, as a reminder, like all my other classes, uh, this one is uh, licensed Creative Commons. It's public release. It's available in my transfer folder and public release form. And uh, actually, I was just going to throw this in there. But um, let's see, I, I did just make, so the point of getting in public release was to get other people to start teaching them. And so the point is, once you know this material good enough, you know, feel free to take it and you know, teach other people in your department or section or whatever. Uh, and so I do have the, uh, the slides and everything available online at uh, opensecuritytraining.info. And so that's going to be, uh, we're going to be grabbing uh, other people's materials from other classes and just soliciting uh, volunteers from other people in the industry. So, thank you. All right, so uh, first some credits uh, for people who've contributed information in this class. Uh, or help review it, like my wife. Um, but the point here is, if you uh, if you have any ideas, if you, you know, bring up any questions that lead to uh, new information that I hadn't previously covered and stuff like that, I'll uh, credit you for for you know telling me stuff that I incorporated into the slides. So uh, later on, there's some material by Rod Hub uh, where uh, you you pointed out that uh, how how Google is uh, native client or Mackle. Uh, browser protection software or browser plugin protection software. Uh, it uses some of the segmentation type stuff that we're going to learn about today. And then uh, Christine Jones, just in the intermediate class this year down in McLean, uh, she pointed out uh, some good information about how the global descriptive table, which we'll learn about later, how that works on Linux. And that sort of uh, brought up a good point about how it probably works on Windows as well. I haven't got around to controlling it yet. but. Uh, when I get there, I'll point this out. I haven't uh, put that into the slides yet. So uh, at the beginning, as usual, we're going to uh, go around the room and introduce ourselves. It's less for me because I know most of the people who take the classes and it's more for introducing yourselves to the other students. Obviously, if you're all in the same class, you all have some common interest in this. So uh, probably good to know who else has common interest throughout the company. A lot of you have, but um, but kind of the point with uh, this class is that uh, we are trying to build up. So the point was, we know that we have lots of people who want to do malware analysis, reverse engineering. But, uh, actually, separating malware analysis from reverse engineering because, for instance, I do reverse engineering on you know the kernel, for instance. But there's a world of difference between reverse engineering just some regular compiler generated code and reverse engineering malware, which is actually trying to screw with you. So uh, I think those are sort of two different things. But the point was we knew that there's people who need to know these sort of skills, uh, you know, or know about exploits, reverse engineering, malware. And so uh, this class is going to get you part of there. You know, it shows some, I think in a newer version of this, I have a you know, recommended line. Yeah, so anyways, the point is there's a lot of stuff you need to know in order to get to those final states. This is trying to give you a more uh, gradual transition there. And so the more of the, uh, of the blue stuff you know, the, the easier it is to go to the uh, future ones. Yeah, and actually, I, I didn't, uh, this, this is an old slide. So actually, reverse engineering is approved, right? It's going to be approved. This will be in, um, in, so that is approved, actually. And vulnerabilities and exploits is approved as well. Corey's going to teach that in the uh, first week of June. But yes, malware analysis, trying to target for next fall or something, fall, winter, something depends on, again, math schedule. Uh, and advanced x86, probably maybe winter, maybe spring next year. But that's all I'm going to be teaching next year. So is the, all the ones that are currently blue will be on video available next year. I think on the reverse engineering and vulnerability exploits, because they're new instructors, they're not necessarily going to have videos on those this year. Oh, that's a good point. Rootkits, I haven't offered yet, but that is going to be um, first week of April, I believe, and maybe third week of April. And Life Planners is one that we already offered. All right, I think we got everyone for introductions. So uh, we're really, you know, compared to some things like Life Planners where we were trying to hit like a ton of things, ostensibly we're only covering a few topics here, but we're covering them very deep, so there's a lot of information. 
So part one is going to be segmentation, which is uh, memory segmentation. It's how x86 can uh, can chunk up memory and say that you know here's one memory segment and its code, and here's one segment segment and its uh, you know data, that sort of thing. Uh, paging is how they go finer granularity than memory segments. Memory segments can apply just to actual physical memory, like sort of one to one. Paging is when you start having virtual memory, uh, and so we'll get into that later. Interrupts. Oh, and I should say that segmentation, actually, the reason we're doing it first is because segmentation kind of underlies everything else. So you'll see the effects of segmentation on paging later. You'll see the effects on interrupts and, and maybe debugging. Not so much debugging. Kind of, but not, not really. So at the very end, we're going to start getting into the stuff which is uh, definitely... So the first three are sort of, uh, for instance, for the malware analyst type people, the first three are things which are good for you know, understanding the system, good for reversing kernel malware and stuff like that. And then the part four is uh, going to be some of the very practical stuff about, you know, understanding how your tools work, understanding how debugging works, input, output, and miscellaneous. Speaking of miscellaneous, uh, if you have questions, you need to ask them right away. This is definitely, again, one of those classes where we're just really hammering on content. So if you get lost and if you don't ask questions and reiterate your understanding and say, Okay, so wait, was that again the logical address goes to linear address how, blah, blah, blah. Right, so there's going to be lots of terms and all that. So definitely please ask your questions when you have them. People on the phone, just, you know, shout out, interrupt. I'm not going to get offended. Um, and yeah, if you're checking the web and, uh, you know, reading email in class, that's a great way to get lost. I definitely, in, in when we have, you know, full classes, I always see one or two people who, you know, they're, they're so busy, they got to keep checking their email. Uh, they get lost and, and they take it multiple years in a row. So how we're going to be, um, <clears throat> how we're going to be doing this, since uh, this seems to be working right now, the first uh, two hours, we're going to go two hours while I have your attention, while you have energy, etc. Two hours, ten minute break, and then it's another two, I think it's two hours, ten minute break, and then one and a half hours, and then lunch. And then after lunch, you'll be falling asleep. Please eat a light lunch so that you don't fall asleep. But uh, after lunch, we'll take a break every hour. Five minutes. All right. So the basic scope of the class, like the intro x86 one, is that um, we're only talking 32-bit stuff, not 64-bit, and or not 16-bit as well. I think in the advanced x86, we're going to take this back and learn some 16-bit because that's relevant for BIOS and some 64-bit as well, just for purposes of explaining what all is there. Um, <clears throat> Mac can deal with floating point stuff again, because you don't really see that that much unless you're analyzing you know, 3D drivers or something like that. And so really this class, unlike the intro class where the point of it was to get you the basic instructions so that if you read you know, small snippets of assembly, you're comfortable with them, <coughs> this one is going to focus more on the underlying architectural <coughs> issues that uh, could potentially uh, have effects when you're analyzing things. There will be a few new instructions, but uh, they're really just, some of them are just thrown in because they are other things that you may see in the wild and it's relevant for you to know. So the main thing I'm hoping you get out of this class is a better understanding of how OS is used the x86 architecture. So we're focusing on Windows in here, but really everything we're learning relates directly over to Linux type things. You know, there may be differences in implementation, but fundamentally OS's and virtualization systems, uh, they both work with what they've got, and what they've got is whatever Intel gives them. So they only have whatever capabilities are exposed by the hardware, and so knowing those capabilities means you can look at this OS and that OS, and you know on both of them, you know, how the interrupts are working. You know on both of them, oh, you know, they're using or not using segmentation. Um, and especially since, you know, we're coming at it from my own uh, security. Well, while these classes are, you know, supposedly meant to be, you know, generic and uh, help, you know, developers and security people and everything, mostly I've only been getting interest from uh, the security people. So we, at this point, we just abandon all context of generic. And so most of our examples are uh, security examples. So uh, it's especially good to know where the hardware is actually exporting the security, uh, how the hardware is enforcing the security, rather. 
And yeah, just to uh, get you curious and want to keep digging in more for whatever uh, I don't really cover to your satisfaction. All right, so before we begin, we're going to do a little quick quiz on uh, the instructions that we learned in the previous class. So, uh, Matt, what's that first one? No, nothing. Uh, add something, something, I can't remember. Yeah, you know I was going to ask what the, anyone else remember what the underlying uh, instruction actually is for NOAP? So we said that's actually a no, it's, you know, NOAP is a mnemonic, but in reality the hardware is doing a particular one, yeah? Is it adding to the next instruction? Nope. It does do that. I mean, it obviously just, it, it skips it and it goes, you know, one instruction forward. But, did you have a guess there? Well, I was just saying, it's one of the arithmetic operators, but now I can't remember which one. It is not one of the arithmetic operators. How about anyone on the phone? Except for, oh, there we go. Jessica, nope, Jessica's wrong. Uh, anyone else? Have, uh, remember what the underlying thing with NOAP is? Remember, the only reason we covered it is because generally people who know x86 have never looked up the manual page for NOAP and they don't know this little bit of trivia. Isn't it exchange so, you know, EX, EX? That is correct. Who was that, Adam? Yeah. All right, good. Yes, it's exchange EAX, EAX. So take a register and you exchange it in the other register, which is itself, and therefore it does nothing. All right, good job. How about... All right, push pop. Yep. And so uh, what are the side effects of, of adding the value to a stack and removing it? Side effects in terms of changes to registers. Yep. So remember that uh, the stack grows towards low addresses, so on pushes. You're putting something on the stack, you're moving the ESP lower, so it's decremented. And when you pop something off the stack, you're taking it back off. The stack is getting smaller, but it goes towards positive addresses, and so it's incremented. All right, uh, call and return. You uh, resetting the EBP to the appropriate place and then jumping into the right code? Not quite. You're thinking definitely of the exit sequence, but that exit sequence is typically uh, multiple instructions or uh, some other instruction which is on the slide, but uh, no. Or can you find the other instruction which is uh, the thing which actually replaces, uh, restores the EVP? That's actually the leave instruction at the very bottom. So. The leave instruction we had said was actually kind of like two instructions we typically see at the very end of the code. It takes, it takes and it uh, moves ESP to EBP, or moves EBP to ESP rather, which like we said, if you take, EBP is always stored at the top of the stack frame, and ESP is down here, you know, growing and shrinking or whatever. And we said, if you take ESP and you put in the address of EBP, you're setting ESP back up here, and it basically is wiping out all of your local variables. You're setting it back to the very beginning of the stack frame. And then it also does pop EBP, which says, you know, the stack frame is usually pointing at a saved EBP for the previous stack frame, because they're that sort of linked list of stack frames. And so it does pop EBP, and then you're now, EBP is pointing at the next stack frame. And so typically you would see a return after that, but then the question is, what does the return actually do after you've done a leave? We were on the right track before. Okay, so you'd said it goes back to where it's supposed to, right? So the return is actually, it assumes that whatever's on the top of the stack, that's a saved instruction pointer, and it just basically pops it off and sets the instruction pointer to that. So basically when you call something, the side effect is call instructions, push the address of the next instruction onto the stack, and when you return, it's taking that thing which the call had saved there and popping it off the stack and going to the instruction after the call instruction, basically. Yep. All right, uh, Reed, move an LEA. Sure, so move lets you take a value in one register and move it into another register. Where you can yeah, what were the three forms of move? So you can do register, register, you can do uh, okay, memory address to register. I think you can also do 
can interpret out, you can do immediate to register as well in Handshake. Yes. And I think so, for the memory address, it's actually you have to have the address stored in a register and you hold the command to interpret right. that address. Exactly. You're thinking of the square brackets and we said last yes. time per convention in Intel syntax, square brackets mean go to memory at that location. So you said store memory address into register. It's actually store the contents of memory into the register. So you take the yes, address sorry. in the EAX, you go to memory at that address, put it in the register, or take a register and put it in memory. So yeah, there are actually four forms. Memory to register, sorry, register, register, memory to register, register to memory, and immediate to register. Remember, immediate was basically a constant, which is just hard-coded into the instruction screen. So if you say move hex B to EAX, you have the move instruction opcodes, and then you have hex B in line. And then what about LEA? What's the difference with LEA versus move? <clears throat> First of all, what does it stand for? That right, Ariel. Uh, nope. LEA. LEA. Okay, someone else. All right, yep, I think that was Jessica. Load effective address. All right, and so therefore, Jessica, what was the difference between, um, what was the difference between LEA and move? In particular, we said there was a difference in convention, but, you know, what does that mean? I'm guessing. I admit it. But I think it's that we, when we LEA, we're dealing with the address. We're moving the address around. Move actually moves the value. Correct. Yes. So we said LEA was that one exception to that quasi rule, which we were saying, if you see square brackets, that means go to memory. Whether it's move instruction, add instruction, op instruction. If there's angle bracket, if there's square brackets around, you know, something, the instruction is saying go to treat whatever's inside the square brackets as a memory address, go to memory, and then you know move that or pop it or add it, whatever. With LEA, we said in that case, since it's load effective address, it's more like you're doing maybe pointer arithmetic or something like that. And so you're saying, you know, take whatever's inside, maybe you do that complex, you know, EAX plus four times EBX plus, you know, 32. Like that. Maybe you're doing a complex statement like that, but the stuff inside the square brackets is just ultimately treated as an address and move, the result is moved in, and you're not actually going to memory at that location. So, yep, that's correct. <coughs> add and subtract or just add and subtract, right? But um, the only thing I would say is uh, if we remember the bill over to the board, just as a reminder in terms of Intel versus AT&T syntax, if we are doing add, EAX, that's not it. EBX, you know, how do we interpret this? What's going where? It's actually EAX equals EAX plus EBX, right? And it's actually the exact opposite of that on AT&T syntax, but we'll not worry about that. Right, so at and syntax flips stuff around destination and source. <clears throat> All right. How about uh, someone on the phone? Uh, jump and JCC. What are those two? So first, jump. All right. Corey is saying jump changes EIP to the specified address after the uh, jump. So what are the different forms of jump, Corey? We didn't actually learn this in the last class, but we'll see. <clears throat> yep, so far and short jump, depending on how far the address is away. So there he's saying there were different forms of jump. One of them will maybe use just one byte in order to say there's some address that's, you know, within plus or minus, well, whether it's in plus 128 or minus 127 bytes away. It can jump. It's, I would say those are jump relative things. So there's jump relative things which say wherever I am currently, take the next address and add or subtract however many bytes. And that can be a one, one byte uh, offset or it can be a four byte. So that would be far or short. Uh, what else? Yep, you can do an absolute jump. So that's saying, you know, I'm just specifying, here's the exact address I want to go to right now. <clears throat> and Corey is saying one more thing. Yep.
Yep, so that's what Ariel just said. Dead beef can be, you know, an absolute thing. And, uh, and then actually, I would say there's also, uh, there's indirect absolute, for instance. There's absolute absolute where you're like putting an immediate and then there's indirect where you're saying, you know, here's EAX and I want to jump to wherever EAX is pointing. And then there's actually an inter-segment jump, which we definitely didn't learn last time, but once we learn about segmentation today, I'll maybe remember to come back. But it's just saying all those other jumps are within the same segment, memory segment. So you got a chunk of memory and it's all just bouncing around inside. There are actually other jumps which bounce you out to some other segment. So for what it's worth. All right, how about uh, JCC, someone else on the phone? Uh, do you remember what, uh, what the point of that, that JCC mnemonic was? It, we don't actually see instructions called JCC, but, uh, but what was that trying to imply? All right, yep, so David said it's jump conditional. So the CC was condition code. So give me some examples of uh, different conditional jumps that we had seen. <coughs> Yep, J and E. That was jump if not equal to, right? That was also called J and Z. So the issue with those conditional ones is they have typically like two names. So you can say jump if not equal, or you can say jump if not zero, because it turns out equality is just uh, measured with the zero flag. So in that E flags register, we said there's a bunch of different little one bit fields which get set automatically on every single instruction. If they modify E flags, they're always going to set those. And so jump not zero, jump not equal, it's really up to you to determine whether, which makes more sense to you. Same thing with, you, know, you can say something is jump less than, or you can say jump not greater than or equal to, right? So there's a whole, there's like whatever, four pages worth of jumps if you ever want to look it up. I usually try not to uh, care about the what condition flags are set. I just use some simple ones like not zero. And if, if it's anything more non-obvious than that, like jump below or equal, or I'm trying to remember what is below versus less than because one's signed and one's unsigned. I usually just go consult the manual or just step over the instruction and see where it went and say, oh, okay, that's what it was checking. <coughs> All right, uh, compare and test. Who else do we have that took the last class? Not seeing anyone else, but does anyone know on the phone what the compare and test instructions are equivalent to? Uh, we said that in reality they were like, compare is like one instruction, but it throws the result away and just sets the flags. Test is like another instruction, and it just throws the result away and sets the flags. All right, so we got Adam buzzing in. And Lee consulting his manual out of sight. <laughs> yes, compare instruction is like sub instruction. So it's like a subtract. It takes, you know, the, you know, if, it, if that ad was EX, EBX, we had sub, or sorry, if we had uh, compare EAX, EBX, we'd take EAX minus EBX, and then it would just set the flags based on that. So it's like if they were both the same thing, right, it would be A minus A equals zero. So you know the zero flag would be set or something like that, right? So compare is just a sub. What about uh, the test instruction? Anyone remember what that is? How about anyone in the room? A what? Yeah. Correct. Yes, it is an AND instruction. There we go. Jessica got it as well. So test is just an AND instruction. So you do logical AND bitwise. You just take all the things, if one and one, one, all that sort of thing. If you add zero and zero, then you would have, or zero AND anything, you're going to have zero result, zero fly would be set, et cetera. All right, good. Getting everything, AND or, X or not. We're just, you know, those are just your standard logical operations. What about this eight SHR, SHL, SAR, SAL? Yeah, Eric. Those are the bit shifts. Yep. Um, and I believe that the sh SHR and SHL move the bits and, and apply zeros. The other one rotates. And not quite, but not close, sure. yes. So she said, yeah, correct. These are the shift operations, and they're bit shifts where you're taking you know, some bits and you're moving them left or you're moving them right. And then there was this difference between logical shifts and arithmetic shift. Uh, Bill, can we go over to the board? <coughs> so she was close. It wasn't quite a rotate where you would assume one bit falls off one side and pops around to the other side. It's close. Well, it's not, it's not quite like that. So how it works is, let's say I have uh, EAX equals you know, 12 or something like that. So 
So that'd be eight four zero zero, right? So that's twelve. I'm just going to pretend on a four bit thing here. If I was going to do a, uh, if I took that and I did shift, let's see, let's do left. Uh, you know, two. The two specifies how many bits to shift. The L for left shifts that way. And so in this case, I basically take each of these bits and move them left by two. So this would, it, you pretend it's doing it like one at a time. And so it would go zero, 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 one, and then it would go zero, 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 zero. And, uh, and here you can see that essentially when we're shifting everything over each time, we fill the least significant bit in with zero. Now this is actually the case always for left shifts. Whether it's logical or arithmetic, that's sort of the, uh, the redundancy. I don't know how you want to say it, but there's two instructions for it, but in reality, they're, they're both doing the same thing here. Any left shift, whether shift arithmetic left or shift logical left, it goes that way. The issue is when you're shifting right. This is where the difference between logical and arithmetic is. So if I have 1100 zero, zero, and I do a shift logical uh, right, by, let's say, two bits. What I would expect is it would go 0, 1, 1, 0, and then 0, 0, 1, 1, right? So this basically fills in, again, zeros at the most significant bit. Now that's fine when you're dealing with unsigned numbers, but if we recall with signed numbers, then the way that we break up the memory space is that there's always a one in the most significant bit of signed numbers. And so therefore, if you're doing this, and if this is, you know, not actually positive 12, but this is in reality, whatever it is, negative, thinking negative 3, negative 4. Negative 3. All right, so if this were actually negative 3, and you're shifting... Uh, right by one bit, which we know that shifting right is sort of like dividing by two. Shifting left is sort of like multiplying by two for every bit that you're moving one way or the other. You don't want it to be the case that when you, uh, when you're, is that right? Yeah. You're right. You're adding one. But that was, let's see. Oh, that's negative one. There we go. It was negative right. four. Yeah. I was like, that doesn't work. Yeah, that was negative 1, that was negative 2, that was negative 3, negative 4. So, sorry, this is negative 4. The point is when you're shifting right, like you're negative 4, you don't want it to like, you want it to be divided by 2, right? If I shift it by 1, I want negative 4 to turn into negative 2. But, and we're going to change this to a shift 1 now. <clears throat> if we do a shift arithmetic left, or right, rather, you shift arithmetic right by 1, and this was the negative 4, you want it to be like this. It goes 1, 1, 1, 0, which as we said over here is negative 2. So everything works out in that case because we've always put a 1 in for the most significant bit when we're doing an arithmetic right shift. So that was again the difference between logical and arithmetic. Typically logical can be used for unsigned numbers. Arithmetic has to be used for signed numbers. If you go back to the example 6 in the intro class, we had that one case where we just had, we're doing multiply and divide and the Compiler turned it into shifts, but if you change the variables from unsigned to signed, all of a sudden you get much more complex things that deal with uh, arithmetic. So does it actually always put the one in, or does it put in whatever the most significant? Yes, sorry, yes. Okay. That was, uh, I misexplained that. In reality, it always puts in whatever, at the time of the shift, whatever the most significant bit was, it always puts that in. So if this were some positive number like, you know, zero, one, 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 right? You don't want it like automatically adding a one because then it just completely changes, right? So in this case, it would go zero, zero, one, one, and everything would still work out in positive land. Yes, thank you. <coughs> All right, so that was the shifts. Uh, how about IMO and div? Uh, does anyone remember uh, what was going on with those? What they are, and maybe a little bit about why we saw IMO but not MO. And yes, as William said, uh, for those shifts, one you always use for, for sign. Anyone on the phone remember uh, IMOL versus div? I mean, it should be obvious basically what they are. Anyone shout out what you think they are? Yes, what's IMOL? Multiply, yes. 
What kind of multiply? That's what you're not remembering. Signed multiply? Yeah, multiply signed. Yes. I believe it is a signed multiply, but even I'm forgetting that. So there you go. Uh, so if that's a signed multiply, then uh, the div is an unsigned divide. The issue we had in the intro class was that uh, for, well, it's not for whatever reason. We eventually found the reason. Someone found the reason, and I forget that as well. Uh, Visual Studio very much prefers the imul over the mul, so it always wants to use that. I believe is signed multiply. But we can check quick because we still have the intro x86 slides on the mm -hmm. desktop, right? There we go. Uh, oh, maybe we don't. We don't have the slides. We just have the code. So let's look at the manual. RTFM, yo. Do, 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 do. <clears throat> I null. Yes, signed multiply. There we go. For whatever reason, Visual Studio loves the, uh, the multiply, and if we had our intro slides, we would know why, but I don't recall at the moment. All right, and then finally, uh, rep stos and rep move. Um, well, I think the reason we saw it in, in last class was IMOL is a very special little instruction because it's like the only x86 instruction that has, or is that, yeah, the only x86 instruction that takes like three arguments for whatever reason. They have a three argument form. So let's see here. Take your destination is a 32, is a register. You got a 32 bit register. You've got an ARM32, which we said in the previous class can be that complex instruct expression with the square brackets where it's, you know, e, it's base plus uh, scale times, index times scale plus displacement, right? So that can be specifying some sort of memory address, but then you can also be adding in another immediate 32 in here. So uh, the reason we saw it was because of that type of instruction. As for what it does, uh, that a mole doesn't do. I don't remember again. Sorry. I'd have to go check the slides. I'll check them at break and I'll come back with an answer to that. All right. So repstos and rep move s. Anyone here remember what the repstos did? So towards the end, it was one of the last instructions. It repeats something. All right, how about anyone on the phone? What is repstos uh, repeating? What sort of action is it taking? All right, Jessica's chiming in. Nope, oh, Corey's taking over the lead. Oh, no, she already said it. Yes, repeat store string. Okay, so we saw like these two examples of repeat, and they both sort of had a similar mechanism where they were setting up some registers and doing something repeatedly. So Jessica, do you remember uh, what registers uh, repstos was setting? And, uh, and that essentially tells you, you know, what sort of storing it's doing? Like Corey's answer, some kind of string operation. Some kind of phone string operation. All right, so yes, she's right that all of the rep instructions use the uh, EAX register. Are you like quoting me from the air there, or are you quoting me from the slide there? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to say what that does then. You cheater. <laughs> Repstos was repeat stored string, store string, uh, over to the board, Bill. <clears throat> And specifically, we had seen it when we were looking at some Visual Studio code where we didn't turn off the uh, one of its sanity check type, uh, one of its sanity check options where it was checking the stack in order to look for corruption. Not in a security way, not like your GS stack cookie or anything. It was just trying to sanity check that there was nothing corrupt on the stack. Uh, and so, RepSauce, you know, space there, uh, it basically sets. You know, EAX equals 
count. And that's the count of how many times you want to do the certain operation. So uh, this will be either copying one byte or four bytes at a time. And the ECX is the count. So basically the instruction, does this, you know, uh, this store, store, stuff, does the store once decrements ECX, does it again decrements ECX. So ECX keeps going down and this instruction stops whenever ECX equals zero. Then it goes ahead and moves on to the next instruction. The other thing it had was uh, EDI equal to the destination. Destination. Right? So wherever it's storing to, to, this is wherever it's going to be storing to. So again, it's either storing one byte or four bytes at a time. And so if it's storing one byte, it takes EDI and it's saying, you know, write one byte here and then move EDI, increment EDI by one byte, increment EDI by one byte, increment EDI by one byte. If it's doing a four byte thing, it increments EDI by four bytes each time. So write four bytes plus four bytes. Write four bytes plus four bytes. So keep in mind, these are different. ECX doesn't care what the size of the, the operation is. It just decrements by one every time. That's a count of how many times to do it. And EDI, it'll increment by whatever the size is because you're not obviously going to be wanting, you know, if you're writing one byte, you want to write one byte like that. If you're writing four bytes, you want to write like that, right? You don't want to be writing four bytes like that and then four bytes like that and then four bytes like that. Maybe you do, but you're not. So uh, finally, the discriminator here with repstop was EAX equals EAX or, let's call this parentheses around EAX, and actually that even doesn't work. <coughs> it's either AL or EAX is the data to write at one or four bytes at a time. So this question was, are those set up in previous instructions? And yes, anytime you see a repstos, you expect like pretty much immediately preceding them, there's going to be some move something to ECX. There's going to be some move something to EDI, move something to EAX or e or They'll maybe move it to EAX, but it'll only be actually using the AL part of it, the lower. Remember we said uh, for our general purpose registers, for at least four of them, they can be broken up like EAX, AX, and then A high and A low. So there's one byte A low, there's one byte A high, there's an AX for the entire thing, and there's extended EAX for all that. All right, so those get set up the immediately before the instruction, and then you say, go ahead, repstos, go. And in reality, this repstos is going to look more like, you know, repstos DS, which you don't know yet, but that's a segment uh, register, DS, EDI, or something like that. And so it's really just saying EDI, you know, write four bytes, write four bytes. And it's going to do this ECX number of times, storing to EDI, incrementing each time as it goes, storing whatever's in the AX or ECX. Now, having said that, does anyone remember what the difference is with rep move S? So we saw rep move S when we were searching, we were searching for it, and where we were searching was in a mem copy. We were looking at the mem copy library code in uh, Visual Studio's runtime C library. We dug into mem copy and we kept stepping into it until we eventually hit a rep move s. So the question is, if rep move s is like a mem copy, how was it different from this ECX or rep stops? Does anyone remember that? Anyone on the phone? <coughs> or he's taking a shot? <coughs> All right, it comes from the value I'm filling in, instead of coming from EAX, is coming from memory as well. Where in memory as well is it coming from, Corey? <coughs> ESI, that's correct. So, in rep move S, That's the same, that's the same, but now this is ESI, which is the source, right? So we're taking from source and we're going to go from memory. We're going to say take from source, copy to desk, EDI, and copy ECX number of times and, you know, whatever size it is based on this. I, probably, I didn't put in here as well, but in 
Intel syntax, you'll maybe see something like byte pointer or D word pointer. That'll tell you what size it's actually doing. In reality, if we go fast in this class, we'll get to instruction size prefixes and stuff like that at the end, and then we'll be able to figure out by looking at the actual opcodes, whether it's one or four bytes and stuff like that. But similarly over here, you have rep move s, uh, you know, byte pointer or D word pointer. And then it's going to be doing something like DS, uh, EDI, and ES, ESI. It's saying from source to destination, right? We're copying from the right to left as with all Intel syntax things. Go to memory at ESI, grab out a chunk of memory one or four bytes big, copy it to memory at EDI one or four bytes big, do it ECX number of times no matter what the size is. So this is, is for instance, a, yes? Uh, Just has got a question in the chat. Okay, would you see this anywhere else but memcopy? Um, you would potentially, I mean, if you're writing your own memcopy, you would do this. If you go back to the life of binaries class when I was writing the virus example, uh, I used a rep move in order to copy the virus into uh, the memory space of like some buffer which gets written. So the, the virus copies itself, so it points at its own code, copies its own code out to uh, the buffer which gets written to the end of appended to the infected file. Um, generally speaking, I would say that memcopy type places are the most you're going to really see this other than uh, inline assembly that people are writing. That's my own impression. I don't know if that's, I can't back that up with any numbers. So, but yeah, basically, that's where I would expect it to see the most. And then Mike, did you have a question or comment? Looks <coughs> so like, well, maybe. All right, well, he's typing. I'm going to finish this off and then leave instruction we said before. Leave was really those two instructions combined. Move EBP to ESP, pop EBP. Yes, questions. So in the example up there on the rep store us, AL would indicate a one byte move. Yes, exactly. On the other instruction, how would you indicate a one byte move? Well, that's really, it, it ends up being, it's actually behind the scenes in the opcodes and prefixes which are used on the opcode. So the only way you can tell by looking at the instruction is whether there's a byte pointer included in the actual assembly that you're looking at. It'll either say rep, move s, byte pointer, ds, and then you'll know it's copying a byte at a time. Or it'll say d word pointer, and you'll know it's copying four bytes at a time. That's how, and in AT&T syntax, it's a little different. I think you may have move s d or move s b or something. Yeah, that, you definitely have like move s b. So let's see what Mike was saying. <clears throat> All right, so Mike was asking, if copying from one memory location to another, isn't there a more efficient way to copy? Does this force the mem copy to copy all data through the CPU? Yeah. So if he's going, if he's, uh, Mike, if you're getting for the point of, you know, something like DMA, right? So DMA is direct uh, memory access. And so if, you know, peripherals or something need to move big chunks of memory around, the whole point of DMA is to cut the CPU out of the loop. It just like it can just access memory directly and copy it to wherever wherever else in memory it wants to. But yes, in answer to his question, this does go through the CPU, right? If you're doing a, a rep move s, it's the CPU going out and talking to memory and say, "Dear memory bus, you know, give me this value, and then I want to go put that in there. And give me that value, and I want to go put it there." So it's definitely mediated by the CPU in this case. But if you were using something like DMA. Uh, that would not be the case. All right. That was it for our review. Any other questions on the uh, instructions that we learned in the intro class? All righty. Now, I was going to quiz you, but I, I ran out.